I would like to make the case that stories and our vicarious experience of stories shapes our instincts, like our reaction to things in terms of us going into fight or flight mode, when, when we relax in response to our environment. Basically, instinct is a really powerful thing, and it has been all through the history of evolution. And I want to make the case here that story is sort of the human superpower for shaping our own instinct. So first let me lay out some language having to do with instinct in the way that I'm using it here. So I want to acknowledge first that biologists object to this use of the term instinct because for some biologists or maybe even most biologists, instinct is this genetic thing. It's something that you inherit through your genes and it's expressed through your behavior, but every type of organism is always going to have that. It's not shaped through experience. I am using this term in a way that's associated with System 1 from Kahneman's book Thinking Fast and Slow. He basically sort of makes the case that there's two types of systems in our body. One is the deliberative system that sort of thinks through every decision and thinks carefully, and that's the slow system. Whereas system one is the fast system. It's our sort of reactive brain. It's deeply connected with our nervous system. And he has a whole bunch of different examples in this book. For example, if you're in a crowd and you're looking for a friend carefully, um, you know who you're looking for, but you're scanning the crowd for them. Um, that's system two, that's sort of you thinking deliberatively, trying to figure out where your friend is. Whereas if you're in a crowd and you're not expecting to see a friend, but suddenly you recognize their face, that's system one, which is just acting automatically. And another fun example from the book is if you hear the word vomit, your body is going to have a visceral negative reaction to that, even on a small level. It's almost like your body's preparing for some kind of fight or flight response. So we have these automatic reactions to things that we cannot turn off. Like you could not uh, tell yourself to not feel icky when you see someone vomit. Um, your body's just going to respond regardless of what you tell it to do. That's system one. And I'm going to refer to that as instinct here. This relates to the concept of irrationality from behavioral economics. I think the term irrationality is really confusing and misleading because it's different from irrationality where irrationality is something that's against your interest in some way. Oftentimes it's something that you end up regretting. A rationality is simply instinctive. It's decisions you make, not because you're thinking about them, but because you're just sort of reacting to your environment. Okay, so I would like to go through four stages of evolution that I think have led humans to become these unique beings that are able to essentially program our own instincts and why that's a superpower for us. And so these four stages of evolution, the first two are stages that we share with other animals. And the last two are going to be unique to humans. So the first stage of the evolution of instinct is what biologists actually mean by the term, which is genetic instinct. Your dog's instinct to smell the other dog's butt, that is probably something that is deeply ingrained in the dog's genes. It's not trained through experience. It's literally something that every dog is going to do naturally because of their genetic inheritance. And of course, when this type of instinct evolved, that was beneficial to the organisms who were able to inherit essentially a set of behaviors that ended up uh, serving the species well. Now, the second stage of the evolution of instinct is instinct that animals and humans develop through experience. And I think of the example of the hot stove that turns red, where you develop an instinct when that stove turns red, you, your hand pulls away, even if you're not touching it, even if you haven't actually figured that out, because you have past experiences that have told you, ouch, if it turns red, it's about to cause pain, and your, your reaction to it is very system one in Kahneman. It's very reactive. You're not deliberating on that 
that choice to move your hand back, but it's trained in you from your past experience. And of course, when we train our dogs, we're, we're basically trying to train them to react in certain ways. Because dogs are probably not deliberative ever, they're sort of always operating on this gut reaction system one level, but you can train them according to instinct. And of course, when species developed the ability to train their instinct through experience rather than through genetics, that suddenly opened the door for that species to move into different environments and to develop different instincts that were well suited to a diverse range of environments. So if, if you have an animal that only has genetic instinct and not this second experience type of instinct, that animal is going to be well adapted to one particular environment, but if you move them into a new environment that's maybe colder or wetter or has more trees or whatever, that organism is going to be less well adapted. And if instead these animals are able to sort of shape their instincts based on experience with the new landscape, then they can branch out and move into new territories. It's a huge genetic advantage. Now, the third type of instinct here is going to be unique to humans, and this is the one I mentioned at the beginning. It's the fact that we can develop instinct through vicarious experience, not just through direct experience. And so the example in my head is if you have a tribe of humans where they've moved into a new environment that has these waterfalls and many other traits that that particular tribe of humans has not yet discovered. If one set of humans encounters a bear by the waterfall, then maybe they should get really kind of scared and their fight or flight system should turn on when they're near that waterfall because bears probably live there. But it, it would be useful if that instinct to sort of be vigilant around the waterfall were spread to other members of their tribe. And that's exactly what stories do. They go around the campfire and tell the story about how they encountered the bear. And their entire tribe listening can sort of experience that vicariously such that they're having the emotions of fear that they would have if they were near the waterfall. And that fear emotion, that emotional response, trains the nervous system such that members of that tribe who have never been around the waterfall are suddenly going to have the same instinctive reaction in that space. And of course, this is going to have huge evolutionary advantages because you can train the instinct through word of mouth without direct experience, and you can sort of adapt well to the environment just based on telling stories. And it's worth pointing out here that I think the story element of this is important. The fact that you're not just giving information, oh, there's bears near the waterfall. That would require system two or the deliberative brain to sort of turn on when you're at the waterfall and be like, oh, I should watch for bears. The story element of this actually adds the emotion so that system one kicks into gear when you're near the waterfall and you don't have to remember, you don't have to go through this slow deliberative process. And so I think storytelling is really the human superpower. So what is this fourth stage of instinct evolution? And this one I actually do not think is complete, but I do think humans have started to evolve this. And that is the intentional programming of our instincts through these meta stories like religion and like uh, morality tales and such, where the purpose of that intentional programming is pro-social behavior. It's behavior that serves the tribe, it's behavior that serves the whole community of people by promoting respect between people and sharing and everything that people always try to teach their children to get them to be pro-social beings. And the reason I don't think this is fully complete in the evolutionary process is that it's actually very difficult to program positive behavior. Like the negative behavior, the sort of fight or flight mode that goes along with storytelling, that's kind of natural because human beings sort of are naturally very sensitive to threat. 
that taps into the loss aversion uh, part of our psyche. And so it's much easier to train people to sort of go into fight or flight mode, to go into scared mode, to, to fear enemies than it is to train the positive aspects, be kind to your neighbor, uh, be, be helpful to your tribe. That's a, just a lot harder to program into an instinct. So, um, so these pro-social stories, I think, do naturally um, train instinct. And some of that is by tapping into the negative fight or flight mode when it comes to shaming, like which behaviors, if you don't act pro-socially, will you get shame from the tribe? But I also think that um, the best types of stories also try to embed uh, the, the positive behaviors into our nervous system so that we do them not just to avoid the shame of our tribe, but we do them because we kind of know that by doing those pro-social behaviors, we will feel at peace with ourselves. We will feel right. Okay, so let me connect this to the channel. Um, on this channel, I'm thinking about the economic landscape and social media and some of these new forces in society and how does this relate to that? Well, one of the things that really concerns me is that social media has gotten really good at tapping into our fight or flight response. It's gotten really good at training people's nervous systems to go into reactive mode because the social media algorithms want us to engage, to react, to click on advertisements. And by doing this, it's basically hijacked a lot of people's nervous systems. Like if you've had this experience where you're talking to someone and all of a sudden they sort of go into a visceral reactive mode and they're kind of on your tail about some word you use that you're like, that seemed like a neutral word to me. That kind of thing, I think, is coming from social media reprogramming people's instincts. And I'm quite worried about what that's doing to society.